Now, you might know when you open a terminal in a Linux computer, you can type commands, for example, the date command, who am I command, ls command to list the files and folders, show the current directory, all kind of commands can be run. So what is this bash scripting? Well, you can automate all these commands and bash is a scripting language that runs in the terminal on most Linux systems as well as macOS. So usually or almost always you can run bash scripts on Linux as well as macOS. So what is this shell script? Well, basically it's a sequence of commands. So it can be a single command or multiple commands. So here we did several commands, the date command, who am I command, the list command, and the pwd command. So you might put all of those into a program. So you would type the date command, who am I, list command, and the pwd command. So now what you can do is to save this as a bash script. In order to do that, it needs to, Linux needs to know that it's a bash script, so you do that with this line. Then we save it as a bash script. We close the terminal here and what we'll do is we'll run this script. So first we need to make it runnable. I do that by going to the program here, right click properties, permissions, allow this file to run as a program. Then uh, I open the terminal again and when I run it, you'll see it run the same commands. So date, who am I, ls, pwd automatically so one by one now if if in your graphical interface in, if in your file explorer you couldn't right click on the script and click properties and set the permission here what you can do as alternative is type the command chmod plus x with your script name so bash scripts so this is a bash script dot uh, sh files it is just a sequence of commands However, there is more things that you can do with it that you will learn in this course. For example, you'll learn how you can use parameters, how you can use variables, how you can use lists and also conditionals. So this will teach you the basics of the bash scripting language. So if you want to create bash scripts, then follow along with this course. Your scripts will most likely work on any systems once you create them. Of course, it can be that one Linux system does things a certain way and another Linux system does things another way because there are minor differences between the Linux systems as well as, of course, between the Mac system. For example, when you search for packages in a Debian-based system like Kali Linux or Ubuntu or Debian, you can use the apt command to install packages. So apt install some program, for example, edit or what? or nano or whatever program you want to install. But if you use another version of Linux, like maybe Red Hat, they would have the RPM command to install. Or if you use SUSE, it would be yum install. And like there's minor differences between the Linux systems because they are basic different products based on the same component Linux, right? So Linux is the core component of those systems, but there are some minor differences between the Linux based products. And of course, with the Mac system, they also have their own way of doing some things. But in, for most of the commands, they work on all of the systems. So in most of the times, you don't really have to worry on it. You can run your script. For example, this script we made will run, run, will work on all the Linux systems that support the Bash scripting, as well as on Mac OS, which also uses Bash language underneath. So this really is a beginner's course. If you are new to Bash scripting, then you can follow along. It doesn't go into any advanced things. just teaches you the absolute basics so that you can create your own bash scripts, automate your system yourself using those bash scripts. And it can also save you a lot of time because now we just use four commands, but there is no limit to the number of commands you can automate. So for example, it could be that you type hundreds of commands and if you would need to do that again, it's very tedious work when you type in those hundreds of commands on the next computer and do it again on the next computer. So instead, what you could do is create a bash script that does those hundreds of commands and then you just run the, run the bash script, right? So in this case, four commands and we just run it when we want to run those four commands. So we just need to run one script 
and it does those four commands, but it could be 100 commands, maybe installing and configuring some program or whatever you want the script to do. So let's create our first bash script. First open a text editor, so it could be a graphical editor or a terminal editor if you know how to use them. So in this graphical editor, every bash script always starts with one line, which is this line. So that's always the beginning of a bash script. It's always the same, let me enlarge the font. So that is always the first line of a bash script. And this tells the terminal that you want to use bash in your program. And from there on, we can do, for example, bash or Linux commands like echo hello world. So that would be our first bash script, which will output hello world. So we save this as a .sh file. Save as, and I'm gonna call it hello.sh.h indicating bash or script. You'll see when we do that, we automatically have syntax highlighting in mousepad. Okay, so now we have this script. How can we start it? The way to start it is to in a terminal. So we open a terminal. And then one thing we should do is to make this script executable. So if I open the file explorer, you see here hello.sh. If I right click on properties, permissions, you'll see it doesn't have the permission to run as a program. So we select it, close. So right click properties and we make the program runnable. You can also do that from the command line. So if we unselect in the graphical interface and type in the command line chmod plus x for executable hello.sh the program will now be executable so if I right click here again properties you'll see it has this flag turned on so we did it with the terminal now chmod plus x so you can either do it with a graphical interface or with a command line if you run chmod space plus x you make the program, in this case, hello.sh executable. So to run it, we type dot slash hello.sh. And you'll see it outputs hello world. Now, it should be quite obvious why it does that, because the echo command is a Linux command that outputs text. So whatever text we put between the quotes will be outputted. For example, if we just remove the world here and save it, so file save, and run it again you'll see now it just outputs hello and you can run the echo command of course several times so maybe you want to do something like this and you'll see now it outputs three lines so the echo command just outputs whatever you put between the quotes so we just made our first bash script the hello world program You can perform normal Linux command inside your bash script. So you might have used Linux before. Linux is a multi-user system. So you are a certain user in the system. It can be the administrator, so-called root, or it can be a regular user. So in this case, we are just a regular user, Kali. You can always see your regular your username when you type the command, who am I? And you can put the command either just in the terminal, you see where user Kali, now control L to clear the terminal. Or you can put the command inside the bash script. So now if we run the program, hello.sh, you'll see it shows our username right in the terminal. Now any Linux command can be written inside a bash script. For example, the ls command shows you the files and folders in the current directory. So if we run that, you'll see it shows you the files and folders in the current directory which is the same directory as our, as when you just open the home directory. So you'll see the same files and folders here because that's the directory Kali starts in by default. The default home directory on the Linux system. We can close the file explorer and you are now able to run any command in your bash script. For example, to show the current directory, you can type the command pwd. So if we run it, you'll see 
the default directory is slash home slash Kali, which has these files and folders. So any command, you know, any Linux command can be put in the bash script. For example, the date command will output the current the date or the call command will show a calendar. You see uh, call is not installed on this one. So it depends of course also what commands are installed on your Linux system. You can also use flex in, in the in the bash script. So for example ls minus L it will show it as a list. So those flex that you some that you can use with commands can be used as well in your bash script. So every line in your bash script can be a single Linux command. Now let's create a new script. So we open a text editor. Remember the first line is always this line for any bash script. And now let's set, actually set some data. So we set some name, for example, we type name is uh, Peter, and then we echo that. And you'll see what it does is it outputs the name. So we'll save it, this, call it example.sh. Remember when we create the script, we need to make it runnable. So either you can do that in the graphical interface or in the terminal, as you saw in the previous video. So I type chmod plus x. Um, example.sh to make it executable and now we can run it with dot slash example.sh and you see it outputs Peter so we defined data here and then we reuse it below now of course you can output it many times so if you run it again you see it outputs it several times here you might be inclined to combine it with text so you can do that like this add a quote around it and say whatever text you want there with quotes and you'll see now it outputs that name inside the line of text so you'll see here my name is Peter and Peter is created from that variable you can of course use it several times in your text so and you can have multiple data defined or variables defined in your program so you can have something else. Let's say now you use two type two data, two variables. So we use the variables name and job. And the variable is just a definition of data. So you'll see if we run it. You'll see now it doesn't output anything because hacker is not defined, right? The variable name is job. So make sure to use the names. So on the left you have the name of the variable and on the right you have the actual contents or the actual data. So if you run it, you see now it outputs those two variables. So it displays the text or the value you define. For example, it doesn't just have to be text. You can say age and then define a certain age. And you'll see it can use numeric values as well. So text values and a numeric value. So this is how you would define data or variables in your program. And with the dollar sign, you can always output them or do things with them in your program. Now you can define data like this, but perhaps you just want to get the username from the command line. So before we could type who am I to get our username. Now, what if we could just take that username and store it in a variable? Well, we can. If we type the different types of quotes and then type the command, who am I? You'll see that the output of that command is now stored in name. So if we run uh, example.sh, you'll see now uh, it outputs the username. Or we can say username is with that name. Okay, if I run it, you'll see now it stores the username inside the variable name. And you can do this for the commands. For example, the groups command will list all the groups that your user is part of. So we can store that as well. We can say, for example, members, members, then 
or actually let's call it group. Now you'll know that naming is one of the hardest things in programming. So I'll call it group and then we save groups. And let's output group then. And you'll see we can run it. Now it tells this error, unexpected end of file for matching. That is because we only opened it here, but we didn't end it. So make sure you always have two, begin and end of the characters. So run it and you'll see now it stores the variables or the output of the commands inside variables name and group. So if I wouldn't echo it, if I would remove this, save it, you'll see it doesn't show any output. It would just store the command output inside those variables and we can output it. Now, if you don't want to, to show it, also you could just comment it out. So if you do this, then those commands will be ignored. And if we run it, you see it doesn't output anything. So we don't actually delete it from the code. Now it is ignored because it has the hash symbol in front. So that, that means that the bash script will just ignore it. It's so-called comments. Now comments can be like this, but it can also be text. So we can add some comment here, output the data or whatever comment. And Bash will just ignore that. So whenever there's the hash symbol in front, all those lines get ignored. And, and it would just do the ones that are highlighted. When you will create a script, it can take parameters. So if we open a new text editor, we add the line for Bash scripts. And now let's say we want to take a parameter. So first we save this script. Let's call it uh, you want actually, it doesn't really matter what you call it. Uh, we'll use the extension .sh, sh for bash script. I'll just call it example. And we could make this runnable. So either with a uh, command c8 much plus x and then example.sh or you could do it using the graphical interface when you click on it right click properties permissions and select allow this file to run as program so now we have a basic program and we want to take a parameter so what is a parameter well you might know now that you can run a script with dot slash and in a linux shell you could add parameters after that for example some number or some name, or let's say like this, and now it is completely ignored. So what we can do, just to take it, because Bash stores the parameters by default, so we can say dollar sign one and echo dollar sign name. So we store the output of the first parameter, dollar sign one is the first parameter into variable name, and then output it. So now if you run it again. You'll see it outputs that it took the parameter. Now you can take parameters, for example, it's a fisherman, whatever. So we could say job is dollar sign two and output set. Now if you run it, you'll see it outputs that. Of course, you can put it in one line if you use quotes. So like this, and then whatever you specify as the parameters, it will then be shown on the screen. So in this way, it reads parameters, which are specified after the shell script when you run it. And those are stored in $1 and $2. Now it might be that instead of parameters, you want to just ask the user for certain information. For example, you can ask or enter your name. So we echo that. And then we read that data. And then you will, can output it. So I'll put it like this. So the difference here is that now we can run it. And it asks to enter your name. And 
then tells it. So instead of a parameter, now the program is literally asking you to enter your name. Okay, so let's take a look at parameters again. We could access parameters with $1 or $2. When we run this script, you'll see it reads those parameters. How we can get a number of parameters? Well, there's another variable which is simple dollar sign hash that shows you the number of parameters so if you run this you'll see it says there's two parameters which is right we have these two parameters so if you would add another one you'll see now there is three parameters so the symbol the hash symbol or the dial symbol together with the dollar symbol will tell you the number of parameters so the number of parameters For example, this would be the first one, and this is the second. So if you run it, you'll see it shows the first, second parameters, and that there are three parameters. How would you get the file name? So it is possible to get the file name as well, and that is simply dollar sign zero that shows you the file name of your program. So if you run it, you'll see it shows the file name of your bash script. So, and now we specify here three parameters, so number of parameters three, but we only see two, so why is that? Well, we just don't output the third one, so we can say third and dollar sign three. If we run it, you'll see now it outputs all three parameters. So Bob Hacker and Linux is now output in the terminal, as well as the file name, because the output dollar sign zero, which is equivalent to the file name. It's possible to store multiple pieces of data. So that sometimes they call it a list, sometimes they call it an array. When you have multiple pieces of data, one piece can be extracted by an index. So an index being just a number zero, one, two, three, and so on. So for example, if you have a grocery list, so groceries, you could use the index. Zero would be the first item in the grocery list, one the second, two the third, three the fourth, and so on. So for example, you could have items like this. Let's create a grocery list. Okay. So given this list, you could define this list and we can make it into a bash script, save it. And we need to make it executable. So I can do that with the GUI or with the terminal. I will do it with the terminal. So I type chmod plus x and change the font here. with our script name. So example.sh that command will make the script executable. And we can run it and you'll see uh, no any output. Right, so the first item, milk, would be index zero. If we want to use the second item, we index one. Third item, index two, index three, and so on. Now, you can also find arrays in a different way with these kind of brackets. And that allows you to leave out the, comma, the commas. So you can take out the commas. So this is a nicer way to define because you don't need to type the commas. So it saves you just a little bit of time. And now we could output the item using the index. So like this. Then zero would be the first item in the list. Computers count from zero. If we run it, You'll see it outputs milk. If we would change it to three, what would be the output? So let's try, we change it to three and you'll see it outputs water. So three is the last item because it starts counting from zero. So zero, one, two. If you do any number larger than this or less than zero, of course it won't give you any significant output. So the index should be 
should exist. So anywhere between zero and the end of the list or the end of the array. So sometimes they call this arrays, sometimes they call this lists, but it's the same thing. It's a collection of data. So multiple pieces of data into one variable. In this case, the variable G for groceries. Now it can be you want to output the whole list instead of just a single item. In that case, you can type the asterisk and then if you run it, you'll see it outputs all of the elements of the list. So all of the elements is now output. You can also remove an element from the list using the unset command. Now we'll do that before showing the list or you can also do it after and then show it again. So let's say we remove an item. We type unset with the index. So let's say we remove the last item. And if we now run it, we wouldn't see anything because as I can show you, it runs and it looks the same. Why is that? Because first we define the list, then we output the list and only then we remove it. So we don't see the list after it's been removed. So if we output again the list, you'll see the last item gets removed. So with the unset commands, you can remove an item from the list. You can also change an item. So to change an item, you can type index, for example, three for the last one, and then change it to a new value. So whatever value you want. And if you then run it, you'll see now the value has been changed. And of course you don't need to output it here. So you could just output it once. We changed the item the value of the list. And we can do this with any item. So for example, G0, and we change it to something else. And you'll see now it changed two values in the list. The first value, zero, has been changed. And the last value, water, has been changed into bread. So we changed two values here. So that's a list. Why do you need lists at all? Well. It can be useful when you want to store multiple pieces of data. So for example, when you have some program that gets the files in a folder, maybe you want to have all those files in a, in a list and then be able to access them. So you could do that with lists like this. Sometimes you just have a lot of items, so you want a collection, some array. Just as in the case of a grocery list, it's much easier to have one list with all of the items than to have hundreds of variables for every product. Programs don't always do the same thing. It depends on, for example, do you run the program as the administrator, as root? If you run the program as administrator rooter, okay, maybe that's okay. But maybe if you run it as regular user, you don't have the right permissions. So you want the program to tell, run it as root. Or it could be something totally different. Like maybe you have a program that it's a file and it needs to be of a certain type. So maybe if it's an image file, it should download. If it's something else, it should not download. So depending situation, depending the inputs. So in bash scripting, you can, you can do such a comparison. So if something compares to something, then do something. If not, then do something else. So a more practical example. Let's say we have a variable user which we get from the command, who am I? Then we can check if the user is root. So root is the administrator in Linux. So if dollar sign user is equal to the user root, then run the program. If not, it could be that it tells you run the script as root. Okay, so now only if the user is root, it will tell running the program. So running program. Of course, there can be multiple lines of code here or commands. Let's say it runs the date commands or whatever. So now if we run the program, you'll see run the script as root or perhaps more explicit, please run the script as root. So it skipped these two commands completely. Why? Because the output of the user of user is not root. So if you run it, you'll see, please run the script as root because user, the output of who am I? So if you type who am I, 
you'll see we are user Kali. We are not roots, so that's why it run this line of code. If we would come roots, so you can become root with the su command, or we can you can run a script as root with sudo. So we run it, and you'll see now it run this these lines of code because when you type sudo in front, it runs the program as administrator. Now similarly, instead of doing the output from the terminal, from the command, you can just type root. And then if you run the command, you'll see it does those as well. However, if we change it to something else, you'll see now it runs the first block of code. So if statements allow you to conditionally run code, so depending on the input. You can also do numeric comparison. So for example, let's create a totally different program where we have the number of counts. So for example, 10. If the count is less than zero, less than zero, then it could be a wrong input. Okay, so now depending on the variable counts, uh, either it shows wrong input or it shows counting. So if we run it, you'll see now it shows counting because uh, it's 10. If we do minus one, you'll see it says wrong input. So you can make sure using if statements that inputs are correct. So you can imagine when you type an IP address, when you type some number, in this case, the number of, of repetition, the number of counts, it should be at least zero or at least one. So for example, at least one. So if it's less than zero, it's wrong input. So now if we would type zero, it's wrong input. Maybe you also want a maximum. So it should, instead of less than, it should can also be that it must be greater than something. For example, greater than one. So. In this case, it says counting, and if the number is greater than one, for example, number five, four, you'll see wrong input. So you can specify specific conditions. So T stands for greater than, T stands for less than. You can check for equality with minus EQ. EQ checks for equality between the variable count, and in this case, one. So you can do different comparison and depending on the uh, inputs, it can either run one code or another code, which happens a lot, so-called if statements. You can find many bash scripts on the internet. So while it's a good idea to look at the code and see what it does to, to learn from that, it is a bad idea to run those scripts, any script you find on the internet because one single script can compromise or your computer can be completely hacked with just one script. So for example, on the right, we have a user that downloaded a script from the internet. They uh, made it executable with right click, uh, permissions, allow executing file as program. So they download that script from the computer. On the left, we have the attacker computer, which will listen for a connection. What the user will do is to run this script. So they open a terminal and they run that script and you'll see, okay, in their system, it seems nothing happens, but actually look at what happens in the hacker's computer. They're actually inside the computer now, so they can say, okay, what system is this? Or list of files and folders. Maybe the, let me close this. Maybe they enter the, the desktop directory and create some file. Now, it seems that Ubuntu doesn't display files on the, Oh, it does. So it's created that file there. Maybe some other file. So you'll see, that's all it took running one script to, to the attacker could take over their computer. So in general, it's a bad idea to run scripts from the internet for that reason. A single script, a single can take over your computer. And this is so-called reverse shell, where running a single script you can completely control another computer. Now I have a course on reverse shells, if you're interested in that, where you learn how you can take over computers. 
just using reverse shells. So using bash scripts and also other techniques that allow you to control uh, someone's computer. So don't download random scripts from the internet and you'll see if they try to close it with Control C or Control Z, they can't even close it. They really have to close the terminal window. But even then, uh, the hacker is still inside the system. So he can still, for example, delete a file. So a file is deleted now, or maybe they create a file. Or whatever they do on their system, right? And so running a script from the internet is just a really bad idea. You always want to write your own scripts because that prevents to your system gets hacked in this kind of way. And you'll see by default Linux systems don't have any firewall. So it didn't also block this hacking attempt, right? And they could just take over the system and all they had to do was run the script. Now there are some firewalls on Linux like Portmaster and some others. But just as a general idea, don't run scripts from the internet. Always write your own bash scripts because there might be some malicious scripts in there where they get access to your system. However, if you want to find bash scripts on the internet, it's really easy. So you can search, for example, in Google bash scripts and then you can find lots of examples, so cheat sheets. And many other scripts. So, for example, here's a cheat sheet with some examples of things you can do with with Bash. And also, you can find them on websites like GitHub.com. So, if you really want to, you can find Bash scripts on the internet. But I really recommend to always write your own scripts because what happens, or what can happen, when you run a random Bash script from the internet, is that your computer gets completely taken over, as you just saw in this video.